Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Dada's Show, coming to you straight from the Bomba Hotel. I'm your host, Ashikombule. The Dada's Show is an inclusion and an equality program where we seek to find out issues that matter to women, what their impact is, the implication is, especially in the context of the 2022 general election. Now, according to Article 43 of the Kenyan Constitution, which indicates that every single Kenyan citizen is entitled to the highest form of uh, attainable health care, this includes reproductive care as well. However, according to a report by the Center for Reproductive Rights and the Trust for Culture and Health, TICA, it still shows that there's a huge number of women and girls who do not have access to comprehensive information on sexual and reproductive health care and the rights. This, of course, has led to an increase in unsafe abortions, uh, an increase in the transmission of STDs and HIV. It's also led to a low uptake of contraceptions and ultimately death. So we seek to ask what needs to be done? Where is the discord coming from? Uh, so before we jump into the panel discussion, kindly have a look at the following feature. During COVID-19 lockdown in 2020, Kenyans received grim statistics of close to 4,000 schoolgirls who got pregnant. According to data released by International Rescue Committee, teenage pregnancy was on the rise as a result of school closing to curb the spread of COVID-19. Talking about sexual reproductive health is still a taboo in most Kenyan homes. Um, we have seen so many things happening in the, in the country, especially to the youth. I really work with the youth. Um, uh, we've seen uh, uh, abortions happening back, by the back end, or back background, eh? yeah. at the back, back street, uh, which is uh, not very good. Why? Because most parents are not speaking to their children about reproductive health. They do not tell them uh, the consequences of early sex, early marriages. Uh, they're not telling them about the family pro planning options that are available. So it is important for parents as early as even eight, or eight because you've seen children who are getting pregnant at nine years. So it is important for ch uh, parents sorry, to speak to their children as early as possible, as early as eight years old. They understand a lot. These kids we have today, they know a lot about reproduction. So if we can start speaking to them as early as possible about sex, let's not be scared. Just tell them what it is. Instead of letting them get it from the world, tell them the truth about reproduction, what happens when you meet the opposite sex, what happens if you, get, um, if you engage in premarital sex, what happens, tell them what it is in black and white. When they understand, they will keep off. They will do what is correct. Mtu anapo amua kwa hivya, maybe kama ni health, ni daktari ame, ame advise kama ni health issue. But generally si fiti, because iko na complications zake, msane za dedi. First of all, without being judgmental, it's very ungodly. Ju apo me take life away. And you got a blessed, so sick to poor. Parents usually shun from the from the topic, but unapata sa zingine aneza kakuambia we jamema below me aneza kuenda no no kipata ball. You get they don't talk about it directly. They usually try hinting you, uh, maybe music or something. But me ni kona mama mungine lively sana. You get. My mom basically will tell me, we Jamaima, we ukicheza utapata ball, na unajua tu kazi ya mtoibu na nigumu, you get? She'll basically tell me like that. Eh, ni muhimu sababu ukisikia kutoka kwa mzazi, utayona ni kama imetoka kwa pande ya juu, utayichukulia una serious note sababu, uh, ya nilakua mepitia, anza kwa mauna mtu mepitia, either ilikuwa na repercussions na kitu, so... Kwa mtu hii kuambia na mzazi ama mkubwa wake wa family itamfanya, aneza prevent kufanya vitu ambayo ni mbaya itakuja kumaffect in future. 
A report by the Center for Reproductive Rights found that women and girls in Kenya lack knowledge about menstruation, contraception, safe abortion, reproductive rights, and Kenya's constitution provision on sexual reproductive and health rights. These knowledge gaps have limited the ability for women and girls to claim the sexual and reproductive health rights from the government. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. I have a wonderful panel. Some beautiful ladies have joined me today. And all of them are a professional in relation to uh, the sexual and reproductive health rights. Uh, right next to me is Miss Faith Fow. She's representing us from AMREF. And next to her is Masi Ogechi uh, from the Give Me Life Africa Foundation. And finally, to the end, we have Ms. Angie Kite, who is a sexual, and, uh, sexual health and re uh, reproductive rights ambassador working with the Action Network for Disabled uh, Youths. Karibu sana, ladies. Of course, I cannot forget to mention and to welcome my lovely audience who will be hearing and interacting with them in the course of the show. So to get the ball rolling, Ms. Fowl. Yes. Would you kindly expound to our friends at home, what do we mean by sexual uh, health and uh, sexual and reproductive health rights? What are some of the rights that we are talking about? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for having us in uh, Dada Show. It's a pleasure, one, for us to talk about this pertinent topic that uh, touches on women um, health. Women cannot be productive if their sexual health is not productive and they are not healthy in that matter. Whenever sexual reproductive health and rights, we normally term it as SRHR, comes in mind, we, what comes in your mind, the first thing is sex, the verb, sex, the act. But then in totality, it doesn't mean that SRHR is sex in totality. The issues around sexual health, sexual rights. The issues around sexual reproductive or other reproductive health and reproductive right. How is your, how are you oriented sexually? That is sexual orientation. How do you identify? Some identify as male, some identify as female, some identify as intersex, some identify as uh, trans, what we call the umbrella of LGBTIQ also, all that is in SRHR. It has issues around pleasure. What are, what does pleasure sound like in sexual reproductive health? It has issues that you had already alluded to earlier on. Issues around transmission of diseases like HTI, HIV, contraceptive intake. How does that look like for young women, adolescent women, and even older women? It has everything to do with affordability, quality, um, access that we've talked about. And some of these are also the rights that you're talking about. How affordable are um, contraceptives? modern contraceptive, because we also know that we have traditional contraceptive. How accessible, and accessibility is not just a matter of infrastructure, we move from point A to point B. We can be in Nairobi, we know Nairobi is accessible in terms of infrastructure, but they are hard to reach. People like probably say, the person who is in Kibra probably cannot be able to access contraceptive vis-a-vis -vis somebody who is on the other side of Westlands, for example. So, array of, um, issues or rights, access to information, quality, affordability, and uh, all these compasses sexual reproductive health. So in short, what I'm trying to say is it's not sex the verb, but then it has issues around sexual health, it has issues around sexual rights, reproductive health, and reproductive rights. Okay, thank you so much, Ms. Fowl. Uh, on that note, uh, Marcy. Uh, as a sexual health and reproductive rights ambassador, do you feel that uh, this, uh, you know, do you feel like these rights are realized, especially uh, where you come from? I can say no. Uh, and I will explain it this way. There are three stakeholders in getting to achieve what Ms. Fowl had explained. We have an individual, uh, then we have the community, and we have the government. Now, as an individual, there is a role you need to play. You need to know the rights. Which are these rights that you're talking about? What is your right? What are you entitled to as an individual? Then the community comes in to play the role of um, morality. Uh, the, the community has a voice in a way that uh, 
it affects how we make our decisions. And then we have the government. Now the government plays the role of unifying all these factors. Now what the government is failing in doing is, uh, first I will appreciate that they are trying their best. They've given the facilities, they've increased facilities around. But the problem is, the facilities are there, but there's no connection between the facilities and the individual. The facilities are there, but the individual uh, maybe is, ha doesn't have the information of what they are required to have, or if they are needed to get to these facilities to get the help that they need. Now what the government can do is merge the community, merge the individual and its roles so that we work as a team. Mm -hmm. I can explain it further in saying that, uh, let me give an example, uh, to explain how the community has a, a deeper role uh, that it plays in the reproductive health um, environment that we are in. I got pregnant and miscarried, but you know I was admitted in the hospital. You're talking to your parents, you're talking to your parents about, you know, I've been admitted to the hospital, I'm not feeling well, and dad asks, what is the problem? I was not able to tell him I have miscarried. Not because it's a shame, but because we've not normalized these conversations, and that is where the community comes in. Yeah. Thank you so, so much, uh, Mercy. That's very well explained. Angie, as somebody who works for an organization that is involved with people with uh, 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 differently abled, you know, uh, what are some of the challenges you'd say uh, women and girls who are differently abled experience when they are coming to realize their sexual uh, health and reproductive rights? Um, my name is Angie Kite from Action Network for the Disabled Youth. We are based in Kibera. Uh, so women and girls with disabilities face a lot of problems when uh, they want to uh, acquire sexual health reproductive rights. Because uh, uh, our doctors and our nurses and our health, uh, the people who work in the health sector, they are not en enlightened about disability. So some even think you don't even need that contraceptive. Some even think you cannot even give birth. So even going to the hospital, even how the doctors will approach you, you might even end up giving birth. Like we have been, for the, the, for, for the past two weeks, we have lost two women. If the doctors were well empowered about women with disability and the sexual health, the reproductive rights of women with disabilities would not have lost her and even the other one. Maybe they should, they should be aware that even us with a disability we need contraceptives, we also get STIs, we also face all those problems like any other women, yeah. Thank you so much and my deepest condolences for the loss of uh, the members of your, of your group. I really do hope that we're going to find um, a solution where such situ situations will not be seen anymore. Um, moving on to you, Ms. Fao, how can the government ensure that there's adequate information to the public on access to SRHR, including comprehensive uh, education in the schools? Um, thank you for that question. In 1994, there was a very, there was this mega convening that changed the narrative of SRHR, it's ICPD, um, International Conference on Population and Development. 25 years later, whatever was agreed in 1994, government came to affirm and reaffirm the commitments here in Nairobi. Yes. It happened in 2019, November. And one of the outcomes that was coming out, especially in the context of Kenya, because it is this global convening, is having policies that are centered towards ensuring that SRHR is being embraced from the community that uh, Masi had talked about, from the community at individual and also within the government parastatal. And we already have, that gave birth already to adolescent sexual reproductive health. We have guidelines that are already there that can act like a base for women, young women to also access some of these things. But here's the thing, as much as um, we are having these policies, government doesn't recognize something like comprehensive sexuality education. There is still a lot of taboo, a lot of stigma 
around basic information, even something like menstruation, because it's part of, you know, SRHR. There's still a lot of stigma around access of information, how the information is being relayed from the teachers. So this is one thing that I think government should be able to do. We should be open even when we are teaching teachers how to handle learners. Thank you so, so much. Uh, so that's work, uh, that is a good place you have placed. So we need to have a multi-sectional approach. Multi-sectional approach. Uh, yes, because mm. it's just not a linear issue. Mm. Okay, so uh, Mercy, various uh, NGOs have campaigns aimed at sensitization of uh, SRHR. Uh, and I believe your organization also has one. Would you mind expounding? Tell us more about uh, Give Me Life and uh, what was the genesis of this particular campaign? I will give you a short story. I got pregnant and then it was a difficult pregnancy. I gave birth. Uh, the labor was traumatizing. Uh, it led to postpartum depression. And after two years, I was trying for a second born. I got a miscarriage. And um, a few months down the line, I tried again, got another miscarriage. Tried again, had um, twins, but one couldn't make it. And um, let me say I have two children, two live children, and I've had three miscarriages. Now, when I got pregnant the first time, uh, she's alive. Uh, she's six years old. When I got pregnant, I hadn't gotten a job. That means, and, and my pregnancy was high risk, so I was on total bed rest. So it meant that I had to stay at home. In my idleness, let me call it that, I decided to get back to crocheting. Crocheting is using your hooks, what oh. our mothers used to do yes. uh, yeah, back, back in the village. So I got into crocheting and I got good at it. I could make garments, dresses, everything, I, I, could, I could make that. It, when I got into depression after delivery, the only thing I, I could lean back to because I got into depression and then I had anxiety attacks and all that. So the only thing that could calm me down is me crocheting. So I could crochet through the day, through the night. When I'm feeling, when I have an anxiety attack, I am, I am, I'm, I'm on, on my crocheting. Now this got me out of depression. When I lost the pregnancies, it affirmed to me that uh, I noticed I was, I, was, I was feeling very alone. You know, when, when you're in this situation, you think you are alone. But when I started talking to people, I'm a talkative person. When I started talking to people, I came to realize that I was not alone in this journey. Actually, most of the people had gone through it. But because we don't talk about it, I think because of stigma and, and the myths that go around uh, the issues that we go through as women, now you don't get people talking about it. Hence, you feel very lonely. When I noticed this, I decided to come up with an organization that can empower these women, bring these women together. We can do something constructive, something that can bring us some uh, food on the table, and then we can have a safe space to talk about the challenges we are facing as women. And the challenges are very diverse. We have those who've lost their babies. We have uh, miscarriages. We have difficult pregnancies. People assume that uh, when you get pregnant, it's just normal. You will get pregnant, go through the pregnancy, and that is it. There are people who go through hell when they are pregnant. We have people who are looking for children, but they can't get them. So it's, it's very diverse. Now, we meet these women. Uh, we are learning how to crochet and do other handicraft work. But we also have a safe space where we are talking about what we are going through. Because uh, we learned that a problem shared is half solved. So that is how the organization, that is how uh, the motivation behind the organization. We have something constructive to do that can bring food on the table, and then we have a safe space to talk about this. We've also identified women who've had severe depression. One other thing I think Ms. Fao can also confirm, uh, the major causes of mental health issues is reproductive health among women.
Now, if we don't address this, then it means we are having a generation or we are bringing up women who are mentally um, going through mental issues because of their reproductive health. Now we have the first step of talking about it, creating a safe space, come pour your heart, let's speak about what you're going through. Then if you need counseling, we have organizations that have come in uh, who are willing to do counseling pro bono. There are severe cases. There are people who've lost everything, who've lost their marriages because of their reproductive issues. They are going through a tough, a tough time. So we now introduce you to the uh, counselors who will take you through a journey of healing. Because if you're not mentally okay, then you cannot be productive even at your workplace. Mm. So that is what the organization does. Thank you so, so much. We commend you for the excellent work that you're doing. Uh, Ms. Kita, you also work for an organization. Uh, maybe you can tell us, what does your day to day look like? I'm doing a project called the Makeway Project with my colleague Evelyn. Uh, we do it in Kibera and Mukuru, where we want to see where is the gap between the government and the health facilities and the people with disabilities. So in our project, we want to initiate all the stakeholders where the women with disabilities who go to seek uh, help in hospitals uh, they will be able to address well, like, where is the gap in hospital? We don't have a sign language interpreter. So how, how is a deaf person going to be helped in hospitals if we don't have a sign language interpreter? So maybe in, in some of our projects, we can even train one in every facility in Muguru and Kibera, where now any person who, are, who is deaf, when they go to the, to the hospital, they can always be addressed well without any discrimination. And maybe in other, in other hospitals there are no rams, or maybe there's no one to help them, like when they have wheelchair. We can even talk to the facilities or the government hospitals and maybe initiate them to have one. Because some of the facilities, maybe they don't even know, they don't have a knowledge about this. Others, they can even tell you they have never had a person with a disability. So that is what we are doing currently, and we hope when we initiate the government and the stakeholders in those slums, we'll be able to go in a long way. We are also doing a project called Andy Pad Bank. Uh, we've been doing a uh, we've been distributing sanitary towels to the girls because most of the girls with disability and also in the slums, they don't have even have that 50 bob to get that sanitary towels. Some are even positive, HIV positive, because they had sex with a man for them to get 50 shillings. Yeah, so that is our new project where somebody can bring sanitary towels to our offices, or we also have a pay bill where people give us, people donate, and the girls in Kibera and Mukuru can get uh, the sanitary towels monthly, yes. Thank you so much. We also commend you a lot on, uh, on just doing the good job and standing in the gap, you know, where uh, maybe government or society has failed. We really do appreciate you. Uh, Ms. Fao, what is the role of society, now that we're talking about society, in promoting access to information on reproductive uh, and sexual health rights? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, one that comes quickly in mind is uh, society should, or rather community they should act as watchdogs. This is what I mean. For government to give people quality and affordable service, then it means we have to demand for it. As much as we know, it is within our rights to access it. Sometimes there's a bit of sluggishness within the government institution. So society has the right to, one, demand for those services. And how do you demand? Ensuring that there's a social accountability within the health facilities because these are where the products are being found. This county was given X amount of money for family planning commodities. Are they there are the facilities? Community can be able to demand. And how do they demand? We normally have um, uh, the, baraz the barazas, the public, what do you call them? Public participation. So during these forums, they can air out these issues 
we know that in the last public um, participation, we allocated X number of you know, funds towards reproductive health. But we can't see it back at the village. We can't see it in our health facilities. How is the money, is, how is the money being used? If money is being used, where are the commodities? Mm -hmm. If the commodities are there, who is accessing these commodities? So finally, before we go on break, uh, Mercy, being an electioneer, what would you want to see the incoming, you know, maybe MCA or Women's Rep of Kibera uh, bring in in regards to SRHR? Make the cleans mobile. And it's possible by using the volunteers, the health worker, uh, health work volunteers. Come to the doorstep. Let's talk about it, even if you're not bringing the condoms themselves. Come with the information. Let's talk about it, because there's a lot of stigma, she said, walking from your house to the healthcare facilities for preven preventive uh, care uh, services. So the government can decide to come closer. Create more clinics. Kibera is not um, well networked in terms of clinics. Yes, NGOs have come in, but the government needs to also come in in a big way. The population is large. Increase the number of facilities. Arrange for workshops. Let's talk about it. The more we talk about it, the more we de demystify so many things, and the more the information crawls even to those who did not attend. You know, the more you saturate the, the environment with uh, the, the population with information, the more the people are informed and the easier for them to get to know their rights and demand to have uh, the, the services that they require from the government. So let the government decide to be mobile, come to the doorsteps, use the, uh, the, the volunteers, that we have on the grounds, and let's reach to the people. Let's make it an individual um, campaign. So much. I hope uh, our members of uh, parliament are watching this and they can, they can pick that up. We're going to take a small break, and then once we come back, we will dig into the question and answer session. We'll be right back. Welcome back. At this point, I would like to invite questions, uh, comments, stories from our wonderful audience. I believe Evelyn has something to tell us. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for this wonderful time. Uh, it's very critical to understand that uh, women with disabilities have issues and we also need to bring on board the intersectionality as, it, uh, as we touches issues pertaining to reproductive health because we find that a woman who has disability has multiple challenges accessing healthcare services and reproductive health. And that's why as Action Network for Disabled Youth, we are coming out uh, loudly and trying to engage all stakeholders, not forgetting the fact that uh, the media, as you are doing now, right now, we are playing a critical role to ensure that at least the reproductive health touches those women with disabilities in all areas of this country. Now my challenge is that uh, we may find it difficult to bring on board people with disabilities because of, because of certain issues. Now we find that in our healthcare facilities, uh, those with disabilities may be perceived as uh, bringing on board the needs pertaining them. Also those uh, infrastructure, not only the accessibility. Let's say if we want, uh, I'm, a, I'm blind and I want to use a condom. The language. How, can, how will I know that this uh, condom, the expiry date? The dates, the communication should be in an accessible language that can be accessed by all people. Now, uh, during this period, we are having the uh, reproductive health policy. It's, going, it's in process, and to have, we are having the public participation. People are giving in their views. Now, I, I try to find it difficult because we find that as much as we are creating those awareness, we are pushing the government to have this policy. And there's this public participation stage that whatever we want to be done within this policy, it will be serving us from 2032 to 2032. This is a, a 10 years period. Now, if we don't give in our input, what we want the government to achieve or what we want the government to do to women, not only women with disabilities, but generally to women, then when it, 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 will, it passes, we'll be making noise, 
push, pushing the government, but it was not captured in the policy, in reproductive health policy 2022 to 2032. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing is that uh, Kenya uh, is a signatory to other international statutes. We, have, we had uh, the Global Dis Disability Summit, and it was, Kenya was, it played a, a very critical role. And there were commitments that were made by the country to ensure that we have better health quality self services to to all women, to, to general, and also putting it to women with disabilities. Thank you so much, Evelyn. So that's a call to action for uh, us here and those at home. Uh, and the government especially, what commitment was done to the policies? How, how, how are we following up? Who is, who is uh, holding the benchmark? Who is uh, doing the pros and the cons and the checks and the balances? Uh, the next one is Judith. Uh, my name is Judy Oyo, an aspirant, Korogosho Ward, and I'm so happy to be involved in this conversation. Uh, what I've come to notice is that uh, a lot of information is not all passed to all the slums or all the areas within Kenya or within Nairobi. Uh, and I'm, I'm so excited that this information is really uh, is really passed in the slum area, let us talk of Kibira, which is well represented in the house. But now in my area, it's not that much uh, uh, conversant to the people because also the constitution tells us that uh, every uh, every woman, every, uh, every girl has the right of to get the message of uh, SR, eh? SRHR uh, in each and every corner of this continent. So that means that uh, as the government, as, the, as a politician, and also as, uh, as, a, as a woman, and also as a girl, we need to pass this. And I would kindly uh, ask uh, uh, Fao here, uh, Ms. Fao, uh, how do AMREF uh, work with also the, the government institution, or how do we, how, how the, uh, your organization work also with the aspirant so that this can also reach back at my society in Korogocho so that they can get the information of SRHR and also help them because a lot of girls, a lot of women uh, don't have the information of the contraceptive, don't have the information of uh, sexual rights or don't have the information of how to deal with the or how to access or how to work with the contraceptives. But because of lack of information, we get most of young girls or young women uh, go through a, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of mis uh, misinformation. Uh, a lot of them uh, die because of uh, uh, of abortion, which was not done right. A lot of women uh, get. Uh, don't have the access or the knowledge of why they're supposed to use the contraceptive, uh, maybe the family planning, and to help them also in their livelihood. Thank okay. You. Thank you so much, Judith. Uh, Violet? Hello. I have um, one question for Mercy. Uh, Mercy, you say that there are three stakeholders into this issue regarding sexual reproduction health. I would like to know what are your plans uh, regarding this sexual reproductive health um, for our boy child. Because I think uh, we are neglecting this. We are not informing our boys on what they're supposed to do or what part they have to play in the sexual reproductive health in themselves and in our girls. Because you'll find a man who will divorce the wife because of a miscarriage. What are your plans? To educate our boy child on this issue. The other one is uh, for Ms. Fao. Um, Ref, I know you have done a lot with community health based organization and more so community health volunteers. These community health volunteers um, are so much, uh, let, let's say they are, they, are, they are not informed. They are as ignorant as the person who is suffering from these issues. What are your, um, your responsibilities to, towards these community health volunteers, what are you investing in them? Are you giving them education? Are you giving them uh, uh, facilities to work in? Or are you, what, what really is AMREF doing towards this sexual reproductive health? Thank you so much. Those are some wonderful questions by Violet. 
uh, how does AMREF work with aspirants to, uh, from Judith to promote uh, SRHR to Ms. Farah? Um, uh, thank you for that question, Judith. First, congratulations for just fronting your name as a woman and as a young woman in uh, Korogosho. And the reason why I'm saying this is that we need more women at the legislative level so that they can pass some of the policies we have into laws that people can be able to use. So, Hongera Sana. Um, on to your question, AMREF is at the strategic level with the Ministry of Health, number one. You asked how gov AMREF is working with government, and uh, that also speaks to what Violet has had us. But let me first address um, uh, Moshimi or Judith. Um, at the strategic level, right now, what it's doing, it's working with Ministry of Health to convene other stakeholders. Remember, I said this is so multisectoral. We are bringing on board Ministry of Education, Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Labor, faith-based organization, and all these other stakeholders in play. So what they are doing right now is that they are reviewing the adolescent sexual reproductive health policy that is underway. So it will look and into the issues of emerging trends that adolescents are now exhibiting when you talk about unsafe abortion, for example, when you talk about access and even comprehensive sexuality education that government doesn't recognize. So some of these things are on the table and AMREF is also supporting it. Um, in working with the uh, aspirant, um, uh, AMREF is not so big in that because it also depends on uh, what donors want with their funding. There are different projects within AMREF that handle sexual reproductive health, others handle FGM only, others handle teen pregnancies, others handle advocacies, you know. So we haven't had a particular one that works with government government or other governance governance so i will be a bit green on that but it's something that you can really look to especially young female aspirant when you talk about pushing some of these laws mm. so the first question that uh, violet asked is uh, around uh, chvs the community health volunteers so it's true yes we work with uh, community health volunteers and one thing that we do even before we dis part them to community. Their capacity has to be built. Capacity in terms of, do you know what you are advocating for, even in the community? So we have a numerous trainings, session that we equip them in terms of how they deal with information, even their own um, human rights issues, because community can be sometimes insecure when you talk about SRHR, how do they even protect themselves as uh, community health workers. Thank you so much. Masi, you will take uh, the question from Violet, I believe, which was about uh, the boy child. What are we doing to educate the boy child uh, in regards to SRHR? Now, fun fact. Fact number one, men are leaders in families. Men are the leaders in church. Women are coming in, but we are not yet there. Men are the majority in the legislative um, uh, capacities that we have. Now, what we have done is forget about these decision makers who are making decisions out of ignorance, not because they didn't want to learn, but because we didn't involve them. And that is the biggest issue that we are having in the sexual reproductive health. The example you gave, a man will beat up his wife because probably she's not getting pregnant or she's getting just girls or she's miscarrying and divorce them because of that. Not because they are not informed, but because even in the information that they are getting, it is not wholesome. They are not able to understand that probably they have a role to play or they need to support this woman so that they can come out uh, together. They can, they, can, they can be the support system that each of them needs. Now that is where we are going wrong and I can say as NGOs, community-based organizations as the government. Now one thing we can do, one, one thing I didn't say about Give Me Life Africa, apart from crocheting, we have other handicraft work that we do. We have knitting, we have woodwork, we have painting, but it's shameful to say that Masi here is confident to talk about what the women in Give Me Life Africa are doing because it's easy to get funding to help train these women. But we don't talk about men because organizations are not, we don't have many organizations that are willing to come in and hold the boy child. 
For instance, in Give Me Life Africa, we train woodwork. We train um, painting. But for these ones, you cannot have mercy vocal talking about them because it, it, no, no one is willing to sit down and listen. But what we've done is, as much as we are training them, we also involve them in the conversations that you're having. We're going to move on to the next question. I believe that was from Siombo. Right, my name is Winnie Siomboa and um, I'm the gender leader, journalist for human rights. Um, just listening to the uh, conversation as it's been going on, um, we heard from Mercy um, telling us about the trauma she had to go through and a trauma that uh, many other women go through uh, when trying to conceive uh, and you fail. And most of the times, um, while she was fortunate to at least uh, get the second baby, we know there are women who have, um, you know, unfortunate enough not to ever get a child by themselves. And therefore now this calls for um, assisted reproduction, um, you know, stuff like um, surrogacy or IVF and what uh, is commonly known as uh, test tube babies. And in Kenya we have um, the reproductive health care bill, which um, has gone through different stages in parliament. Um, I think the first uh, time it was introduced in parliament was in 2014. And all these years, we've never gotten to a point where um, this bill becomes law. One of the times that it was, the last time uh, it was shot down was on basis of um, three things. First one being uh, that the misconception, and I use the word a misconception, that the bill uh, seeks to promote access to abortion, um, that it also seeks to introduce um, uh, se uh, reproductive or rather sexual education to children. And the third one was on the assisted reproduction. So then my question is um, going to um, Faith about what it is that um, the government can do to ensure that, um, first of all, that reproduction, assisted reproduction uh, is given the importance that it needs to be given. Is it really a luxury as um, most people want to think that it is? Or is it a necessity that uh, is um, heavily pegged on reproductive health? Thank you so much, Siombua. Hello, we everyone. My name is Phineas. Um, I have heard Ms. Fao talk about maybe some of myths and misconceptions about um, maybe the, the women, uh, reproductive health, and that's uh, the rights. Um, maybe tapping into what has been happening uh, or the talk of every day in our nation, um, also about the, the men uh, contraceptives, that is um, the control uh, for maybe reproduction. Um, maybe does it uh, tap closely into what we are talking today? Okay, those are some wonderful questions by Siombo and Finis. Uh, I believe we'll let Ms. Fawe and uh, Mercy to take that up and then we'll have a parting shot from, uh, from Angie. Sure, um, uh, thank you. Those are brilliant questions. And it makes it super hard for me to answer <laughs> conclusively because they are brilliant. <laughs> now, um, on to Sio what uh, Siombo has raised, I agree. The SRHR policy would have been a game changer especially in the country. And I remember when uh, first hearing was going to be done in the parliament, all the men disappeared who were supposed to be discussing this bill. So you can't discuss the bill when you don't have a quorum in the parliament. So which means they don't see how heavy and how pertinent some of the elements that she has raised, like assisted reproduction, is very key to women who cannot be able to go through normal delivery process like like other women. Even when you talk about the SRHR policy, there are a number of policies that have been there, progressive policies that can put us where we want, but then Sirikali is thus not committing mm -hmm. to these policies. That's why I'm saying I can't answer it conclusively because we have not even been able to implement what we signed to implement 20, from 2013 onwards, onwards until now. So what I feel is if you can have more of Judith both at the county and at the national government, because women can call out on women, men can call out of men. If I tell you a story about miscarriage, Masi can hear me more because probably she has gone through that. But if I tell an Andrew or a John somewhere, they might not take it with that weight because they don't feel the weight of 
reproduc reproduction. They don't feel the weight of having contraceptives and side effects of contraceptives. So that doesn't fall on them much. But if we have legislatures who are women, and I thank God that right now we are having more women fronting out their name, mm -hmm. then it means we can make a step towards having these policies and bills becoming a law that can also help us as women. Mm -hmm. It brings me down to what Phineas had already asked. How is um, male contraceptive intake affecting women, right? Affecting women. We have what we call men engagement. A lot of contraceptive options are geared towards women. We have more options than male. Mm -hmm. And male is common, what is common to them is uh, the condoms. That sometimes women find it so hard to negotiate even for that use. And when you talk about SRHR, we're also talking about body autonomy, ability for me as a woman to say when I want to have children and how many children I want to have. So if we leave male to be the ones who are taking contraceptive in terms of use of condoms, that we know that there is also a good number of them that do not adhere to good use of condom, then it means it also poses women at a risk of one having unintended and and planned mm -hmm. pregnancies mm -hmm. that later on leads to abortion. unsafe abortion or even safe abortion that mm -hmm. sometimes you have mental issues around it. Mm -hmm. So it couples up to so many things and that's why I feel also male engagement is very, very essential because you can engage men at different level. Men are agents of change in SRHR as much as they don't have a lot of options here. They can call out male. Mm -hmm. We have issues around FGM. We've, um, uh, we've talked to Morans about it. And they're coming out and saying, it's okay, we can, we can marry women who are uncut. We've had elders that make decisions around even FGM. And when they come out very strongly and say, we don't want our girls to be cut, then girls don't get cut. Mm -hmm. If you have Morans saying, we can marry an uncut woman, a woman doesn't feel obliged to escape to go get cut yeah. because we are identified by misses rather than you are okay being a miss. So male engagement is very important at this level because they can call out male and they can be able to change the whole narrative around SRHR. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so, so much, Mercy. Now, Kenya is majorly a Christian country. And... Um, that means the church plays a key role in things pertaining to how the country runs. And uh, in a way, we've forgotten to involve the church or the church is not willing to work with, 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 the, with the, uh, let me say, the government and the CBOs and NGOs uh, because of the beliefs that we have. I can say that uh, assisted reproduction is a very sensitive topic. I remember a while ago I, I wrote a, a Facebook post uh, talking about IVF. And um, I was also talking about uh, choosing to have an abortion if uh, it's uh, risking the mother's life. And uh, the reactions I got from the post were not friendly. Not because the people are not willing to have a conversation or have a look from the perspective of the affected, but because we are a Christian uh, country. We base our decisions uh, as per what the Bible says and what probably our pastors and bishops teach us in church. Now for this, for assisted reproduction uh, discussions to take priority in our lives so that we, we are receptive to the fact that there are people who might not get pregnant naturally. It is possible we've seen mothers who've stayed for 50 or died before they, they gave birth. If we are able to include the church so that it also has this conversation from that side, then it will be easier 
for the community now at large now on this other side to adopt assisted reproduction. But it's a very sensitive, sensitive topic. Now you asked specifically about our organization and what we are doing about it. I can say for me it's purely let's demystify the myths. Let's speak about it. I have realized the more, even for a child, when you, they learn more when you repeat things. I am speaking to you about this today. It's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong. It will sink in finally. So let's have these conversations. Let's sit down and have a discussion. You are saying you are pro this or you are against this. What are the reasons? Let's have a conversation. With time, I will get to understand your perspective. You will understand my perspective. And then we will move closer to embracing assisted reproduction. Wow. That's wonderful. Can we get our parting shot for the day from Angie? Angie, what would you want uh, our people at home, what would you want the major takeaway for this, for this con conversation being? Both talking about the disabled and everybody else. What would be your main takeaway from this? Um, my takeaway would be let's be open about sexual health, reproductive rights, education. Let's talk about it. Yeah, if we don't talk about it, we will never change. And um, I would also commend the community health volunteers. They are really doing a great job in the society. When the organizations, when the NGOs are not there, when the government is not there, they are always there for the society. They, always, they know what is happening. And they will always assist, even if they don't know how to handle people with disability or any other woman, they are always there. So community health volunteers are doing a very good job and let the government be accountable, yes. Thank you so, so much, Angie. I don't think there's anything I need to add. We've come to the end of today's very interactive show. Uh, for for women and for girls to live their best life, to be the most productive and to also contribute in nation building, then the government must honor their commitment to creating uh, and highlighting programs uh, that, uh, that focus on sexual and reproductive rights. And they must follow through with that commitment. Uh, what is your MCA? What is your women's rep? What are they talking about SRHR? In, uh, as they go on on their campaign trails. We would definitely want to hear from you, so please keep us engaged on our social media platforms. We look forward to your comments, to your responses, to your questions. The greatest masterpiece of the heart of God is the love of a mother. All of us at the Dada's Show and our esteemed partners, journalists for human rights, want to wish you a happy Mother's Day. Let this day remind you that you are doing a good job and that you are loved and appreciated. In the spirit of appreciation, our location partner, the Boma Hotel, has mothers at heart. For the next one week, spoil your mother to the Elixa Mother's Day Spa Treat and enjoy discounted prizes on massages and scrub, among other services. Let your mother enjoy this year's Mother's Day. The Dada's team and I took to the streets to celebrate with you this Mother's Day. Uh, my name is Margaret Wanjiko Gashao, a student at the University of Nairobi. And I would love to wish my uh, happy Mother's Day to my mom, Lydia Wanjiku Gashao. Uh, we love you so much for being so caring, loving, and being there for us. Hello, Naitua Ocheng George Jouma. Jinangwe Usani Nijex. Na wish my a happy Mother's Day. Asante, Mama. Na kupenda, Mama. Hello, my name is Natasha, and I'd like to wish my mom a happy Mother's Day. She's called Faith. She's the best mom in the world. We want to thank you. I want to thank you for everything that you do. And yeah, you're just the best mom. You're amazing. And thank you for also believing in me. And yeah, I love you so, so much. Uh, my, name, my name is Dominic Mbosu. I would like to wish my wife and my mother uh, a happy Mother's Day. And all the women, because I know we have come from ladies and we love them. My name is Esther Merino. I work at the University of Nairobi. I want to wish my mother Mary a happy Mother's Day and I want to wish all the mothers in the world happy Mother's Day.
My name is Doris Nkatha. I'm the producer for Dada's show. And I want to wish my mom, Lucy Gitonga, a very happy Mother's Day. You're the rock that holds our family together. And all of us from the family really appreciate you. Also for the viewers for Dada's show, we really appreciate all mothers out there. And we want to wish you a very happy Mother's Day. Enjoy the day. My name is Ashiko Mbune and I would love to wish my mother Agnes a happy, happy Mother's Day. Thank you for being the wind beneath my wings, my sounding board and my pillar of strength. I love you. Happy Mother's Day, Mom.